Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. I'm your co-host, Debbie Cox Bolton. In this episode, I speak with Ken Weber, who, along with his son, Daryl, co-authored the new book, Branding Democrats, a top-to-bottom reimagining of campaign strategies. We talked about the difference between marketing and branding, the need for Democrats to play the long game in order to build a lasting brand around our values and policy ideas, values and ideas that the majority of Americans support. Ken shares ideas and stories from the book, including how Democrats can take back words that have been co-opted by the right, the need to tell stories, and how best to reach voters. I hope you enjoy. Ken Weber, welcome to An Honorable Profession. Debbie, it's my pleasure and honor to be here. You guys have a great reputation. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. And we're excited to have you on to talk about your new book, which you co-wrote with your son called Branding Democrats. I thought I would just start by kind of asking you what prompted you guys to write the book. You have a background in finance and in marketing. Your son's a a brand expert. So tell me what problem are you trying to solve? What led you to want to write a book about this? Well, well, I can answer that for an hour or I could give you one minute. (laughs) We'll do the one minute to start. We'll start with one minute and we'll go from there. Yeah. I actually say it in the book. I got tired of yelling at the TV screen is the short answer. I built my business. This is Weber Asset Management. If you can see the office behind me from scratch. I mean, I, I came from a whole other field. I wasn't in this field and I built it built it to be in the top 10% of investment advisor firms, of which there are thousands, top 10% based on assets under management, because I'm a pretty good marketer. I understand branding. My son, Daryl, is a high-level branding expert. He works for major companies around the world, names you know, as a true branding expert. I started the project. I brought him along, and that's how we, uh, we started it, because the original article, which I wrote just for online for like a five-page piece, was Democrats suck at branding. I changed it to Democrats stink at branding now for the book. <laughs> <laughs> but they just are. The Republicans are very good at branding. We're terrible at branding. Yeah. There are ways we can fix it. I said, let's have a book so that it's not just in talking. It's actually in your hands. It's in paper. You can make notes. And it has more lasting power than just talking about it. Yeah. And this book is meant to be for Anybody who cares about the Democratic Party, of course, but also how to guide for elected officials, candidates in particular, as you lay out in the book. Let me just interrupt. I'm sorry. But the subtitle is A Top to Bottom Reimagining of Campaign Strategies. And I interrupted you <laughs> because it is top to bottom. It, it's from presidential all the way down to the local school board. Yeah. And there's some very practical thoughts and ideas and examples in the book that we'll get into a little bit. But I want to start with a higher level question, which is you talk a little bit in the beginning of the book about the difference between marketing and branding. So maybe we could start there. What What is the difference between those two things? Right. So marketing is we sell watches. Our watches are on sale this week. Buy our watches. That's marketing based on the current situation. Branding is Rolex. They don't really tell you how about the inner workings of the watches. They just give you a feeling of luxury. They take out full page ads with Roger Federer or whoever the current champion is. And you associate Rolex with luxury or prestige, but it's long-term. They've been doing this for 20, 30 years. It's branding. Marketing is for now. Branding is for 10, 20, 30 years. So branding is how you feel about something. And that's what we want to change with the book, how people feel about it. Yeah, that makes sense. And Do you want to take a stab? I know, again, this is a really in-depth question that we could spend a whole hour on itself, but do you want to take a stab just at the top kind of talking about what do you think the problem with the Democratic Party brand is? Just so as we go into some of the, the solutions, maybe that would be a good place to start. Yeah, well, it is a great place to start. If you ask people issue by issue, women's rights, worker rights, protect the air and the and the environment, one by one. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. 
but I won't vote for a Democrat. Democrats are crazy or, or radical or whatever it is. So that right there is the summation of what the problem is. People have this feeling that Republicans are better for the economy. They're not. Better on law and order. They're not. And they have these phrases, tax and spend liberals, all these phrases that we, we've grown sick of. They have those. We don't have those. As you know, in the book, we have a list of all the phrases that Republicans have used against us. And what are the phrases we use against them? And it's there's a list, but it's blank <laughs> because we don't have any. Thanks to people like Frank Luntz over on the Republican side. They have great branding. We don't. We are trying to fix that. Yeah. And I, let's talk about that a little bit, because that, that's something that we think about a lot about at the New Deal is kind of messaging and framing and, you know, even values based words that resonate, as you said at the beginning, that make people feel and, and have this sense of what you care about and who you are. And so you do talk a lot about this. I think I'll quote you to yourself. I love that to say is that it's time to claw back the good words and counter the bad. Did I say that? that? That's pretty good. I like that. Pretty good. Yeah, that's in the book. I liked it too. I pulled it out. <laughs> so some of those words, again, at the New Deal, we talk a lot about, I mean, words like freedom and patriotism and economic growth and all these things that you were mentioning seem to be have been co-opted by Republicans and, and somehow Democrats are afraid to talk about those or to, to bring to get them back. How do we get them back? Yeah, well, that's that's why I wrote the book. So it's t- top to bottom, it, it's long term. It's you change the advertising. You change. I mean, for example, I'll just get right to one of my specifics. In the book, we have what we call proposals. I forget we had we had a clever phrase about it. A modest proposal. For example, here in the New York area where I am and Daryl is, during the last campaign season, 2020, because this is a tightly, you know, there's, there's a high density population area, we were getting TV ads for six or seven Democratic congressional candidates, all saying basically the same thing. So we say, first of all, that's inefficient. There should be branding messages that go on throughout the year talking about the democratic values. And so stop doing that. One of the phrases we're using is the party, not the person. Democrats should focus on the party, not the person. What's important is the party, not the person. Joe Biden will never not be old. Every candidate is flawed. Every democratic candidate is flawed. By trying to have ads to say, I believe in this and this and this, but my opponent, this and that, whatever it might be, just muddies the waters. No. Are you for women's rights? Are you for worker rights? Are you for health care? Are you for breathing clean air and drinking clean water? All the things that Democrats, 98% of Democrats agree on, that should be how we spend our billions of campaign dollars, getting the long-term message out about the party. It's the party, not the person. Again, because every candidate is flawed, every candidate is vulnerable to attack, get past that. Talk about who we are, what our core beliefs are, and get those messages out on a regular, repetitive basis. Do you think Republicans do that better? They have been doing it better. They have been. Again, as I said earlier, things like patriotism. You brought it up. We talk about it in the book. Well, we're actually numerically slightly more American. You know, more Democrats are, are registered than Republicans. But when you think of patriotism, you think of the flag and that people think of Republican. If you put up a flag, oh, this house is a Republican. Well, that is awful. We have to switch that. So when we say top to bottom reimagining of campaign strategies, a simple thing like yard signs. Supposing every Democratic yard sign said proud American, proud Democrat, all of them. Yeah. I do think that was interesting that you talked about in the book about saying I'm a proud Democrat. I feel like, you know, we work with a lot of people who are elected across the country, some in very red areas or purple areas. And so I know I've talked to a a number of people who feel sometimes like they have to run against the branding of the National Democratic Party and say I'm a different kind of Democrat. And I think your point is that people should not be having to do that. That's the problem, right? That the National Democratic Party brand needs to be one that appeals. Right. They're looking at the current, you know, what's happening this month. But if you, again, if you talk to people individually about individual issues, the majority clearly are on our team. Right. Absolutely. And we give the example of when Obama ran in the midterms, so many Democrats wouldn't even say if they supported the president. Oh, well, you know, I'll decide that's a personal matter. And they lost. And they lost. It That didn't work. And by the way, people know you're a Democrat when you're doing that. You're taking, you know, the D's next to your name. So it's no secret <laughs> that you're... <laughs> Right. So what did they accomplish? And they and the proof was in the pudding. They they lost. 
the majority of people who who didn't admit <laughs> I'm doing it now that they support Obama, they lost. And we give the example of Joe Ossoff. Mm-hmm. John Ossoff in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Georgia. He talked about his congressional race before he won his Senate race, I think. Right, right. He did poorly because he refused to, or he was advised to or whatever, to say he's a staunch Democrat and he lost. And then when he ran for Senate, everything switched. He got better advisors or whatever it was. And he won in a red state. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree that we have to think about those words that we can't cede any ground or or cede any words that we absolutely believe. And I think there are certainly opportunities now being presented to Democrats to just take the patriotism bill. You know, we're talking about a party who stormed the Capitol and tried to overthrow an election and continues to talk about election fraud and undermine our institution. So, you know, I think that there is an opening and an opportunity for minds to change about party brand right now on some of that. And again, I think that, but your point is, is, is that you, this has got to be a long-term strategy that we do over years and years and years. This did not happen overnight that these things all of a sudden became associated with Republicans and it's been a deliberate attempt and we need to do the same. Right. And so, you know, in the book and even post book, we have these ideas for how commercials, what they should look like and just get away from the current situation. It's long-term branding. Start getting into people's minds who Democrats are. And we want a new slogan for Democrats. Democrats fight for the people. Democrats fight for the people. Make that known so that when they walk into a booth, look, it's top to bottom. So they may vote for the president. We want them to vote all the way down. They don't know those names. They don't know the congressional candidate. They don't know the judge. They don't know the city council person. Vote for the Democrats because Democrats, why? Democrats fight for the people. Oh, yeah. The other side helps the the millionaires and billionaires and corporations. I want the team that fights for me, the people. So that's long-term branding. If you have a slogan like that and you stick with it, not I'm with her for six months, terrible slogan, by the way, told you nothing, told you absolutely nothing, but Democrats fight for the people should be for many years so that people understand who we are. Again, you and I are political junkies. I'm making an assumption about you. (laughs) Yes, I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah. 94%, 97% don't read a newspaper, don't watch the Lester Holt news. So we have to reach those people. And that's where branding is more important than the marketing. Yeah. So something happened this week that I wanted to ask your opinion on. So because I just think it's fascinating, right? So Marjorie Taylor Greene was speaking to the uh, Turning Point Action Conference and did what she... I'm sure our listeners who are mostly political junkies already know this, but just in case, and basically did what apparently she thought was a hit job on the president of the United States, talking about comparing him to Teddy Roosevelt and FDR and talking about how he wants to invest in the American people and help on infrastructure and climate and all these things. And if he's reelected, he's going to continue the job. And basically, as as my friends who are listening will know, you know, our president turned that into a a campaign ad and said, yep, I endorse this. (laughs) But I thought that was such an interesting thing to happen right before I was going to talk to you about branding, because apparently to me, that is a great brand. The fact that she, everything she said, I think the president said, yep, that's exactly right. That's what I'm doing. I'm fighting for people. I'm investing in America, to use his words. That will go down in branding history. You know, textbooks in the future. (laughs) We'll talk about that. Yeah. Tell me what your thoughts on that, though. Like, what is, is the Republican, actually, I'm kind of baffled by it. So what are are your thoughts on why she did that or what she was trying to accomplish or, and and how great it was that uh, the president was able to turn it around? (laughs) Well, you're not assigning me to to speak for Marjorie Taylor Greene, because I refuse. Of course I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. That's a fair question. Fair point. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think anybody can. (laughs) Yeah. As I watched the original, I said, what is she doing? Does she not realize? And then kudos to whoever it was in the White House who said, grab that. We can use this. And I hope they just play it over and over everywhere, because it shows Democrats fight for the people. We do want to build the bridges and the the tunnels and broadband and and everything else that Marjorie Taylor Greene thought was awful. It was bizarre. I mean, the whole thing was bizarre, but I'm so happy. And again, in the book, we talk about Democrats have a history of being wonky and dealing with facts and figures that go over most people's heads. But here was an example of getting on the offense. Too often, and we talk about this in the book too, Democrats are on the defense. We wait for the issue of the day, and then we try to respond. Forget about the issue of the day. It's the big issues, the branding issues, the evergreen issues. That's what we got to pound into the public's consciousness. Before we continue the conversation, I want to let you in on a tool that's been transforming the way political comms and digital teams of all sizes work. The tool is hashtag viral, the newsletter. 
brought to you by our friends at Girl in the Gov. Hashtag Viral brings social media content ideas, platform explainers, and best practices through a political application lens to inboxes every Tuesday. This skip the meeting, make it an email method of social media consulting has saved teams time and money, all the while providing easy to apply content concepts across all major platforms. Covering the works from Instagram and TikTok to YouTube and Twitter, Hashtag Viral shares pertinent updates on platform features and best practices. Best yet, it's a resource designed by two political influencers who know the intersection of politics and social media like the back of their hands. To subscribe, visit www.girlinthegov.com backslash newsletter. Now back to our episode. Talk a little bit about some of the other tactics, I guess, if you will, in the book. There's a couple other ones that I resonated very much with me, things we talk about a lot. And we're getting to one of these with the the Marjorie Taylor Greene incident, which is to tell stories and to talk about the impact that we're having in people's lives. That's one. Right, right. So yeah, so in the book, again, there's lots of examples about what we think should be done. So instead of ads that attack your opponent, have stories, have actual people. I am very much against these voice of God commercials, where we talk about how good our candidate is and how terrible the other candidate is. Just talk to people. The example, by the way, that it's not in the book, but these ads for a uh, brain, <laughs> now having a brain freeze, but these pills you take, Prevagen or whatever it is, to make your brain better. All of them, and there's no science behind it between you and me. Can you keep a secret? <laughs> I can. I don't know if our listeners can, but we'll, we'll, we'll give them the message of the doubt. They have a guy, an old guy or an old woman. Well, I was a little foggy and I started taking this pill and now I'm much better. But it's just a person talking. I envision, for example, ads that show a farmer in a field saying, I became a Democrat because I want my crops to be clean and pure. I have a nurse say, I became a Democrat because I see how the health system is failing my patients. I have a scientist. I'm a Democrat because I believe in the scientific method. You know, I have a soldier. I'm a Democrat because I see what, it, like that, just people, real people talking. Yeah, I think that telling stories is super important. And and again, focusing, I do agree that I think Democrats, we have a tendency, I think a lot of us are problem solvers, right? And we have a tendency to want to talk about getting the weeds of how we're going to solve the problem of, you know, I, one thing we I've talked about my whole career is Democrats have a tendency to lapse into policy wonk speak, like you said, I mean, to the extreme example that is using the initials or something for the a bill, right? Or the bill number, like nobody knows what you're talking about, right? Or Al Gore's famous lockbox about Social Security. Or lockbox. So I think that, you know, having those, an ability to turn that around and to say, this is the values that we stand for. This is what we're fighting for. And this is who we're helping and and why it's going to help you is really important. Another example, by the way, reminds me, because I haven't brought this up on other podcasts, but not that there are other podcasts, but if there were, Joe Biden, as I say, he'll never not be old. Imagine any, he's a stutterer, he has gaffes. Imagine if there was a quiet scene with him. And he said, you know, folks, I do stutter and I do forget things now and again, but I've worked my whole life for you. I will never not stop working for you. And I'm going to put a team around me of the best people that America has. Something sincere, admit your weakness, deal with it, be honest, be a person, and then move on and say, here's what we're going to do. So I have a question a little bit about that, because it's something I hear a lot from people and something we're going to talk about on the podcast coming up shortly is, is the media's influence in all of this, right? I wonder about the ability to build a brand when the media seems to be incentivized to bring on people who are the extremes of both parties I happen to I mean I happen to believe that one party in a, as as a whole right now is is extreme and radical and the other party is you know our party is actually governing from the center. That's not a belief that's empirically true. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. The, the way they set up the media works is you know we've got people who are they're never looking for people who are looking for common ground. They're never look, talking about solutions. They're always talking about the divisions. And I just wonder your thoughts about how to how to build a brand or how that factors into building a brand, I guess. Well, again, the brand building just spans everything. It's it's timeless. It's evergreen. So it's mass media in terms of commercials. It's print media. It's social media. By the way, I'm on TikTok branding Dems. I have one video that has 1.3 million views. Not bad for an old guy, huh? Amazing. What's the 1.3 million views of? 
I do almost one TikTok a day and you just have no idea which is going to blow up. To me, they're all good. I put my heart into every one of them. It was about the submersible that went down. It was before they found out what happened. And I, I talked about the costs of that and who's going to bear the costs. And, but for some reason, it resonated and 1.3 million people. Yeah. So you never know. But but social media changes by the day, by the hour, by the minute. I mean, the algorithms are constantly changing. So it's all of that. You need print media. You need radio. You need television. You need all the social media platforms. You need town halls. We talk about town halls. One of my best friends is Congressman Mark Pocan, who came in. Uh, not only did, does he win every year, but in the last election of the 435 congressional candidates who ran for the House, he came in second in terms of raw votes. So he knows stuff. And one of the things he does, and he, he endorses everything in the book, by the way, one of the things he does is town halls. He does a good number of them. And he was next door, next district to Paul Ryan, former Speaker of the House. Paul Ryan refused to do town halls in his own district. Mark Pocan went over there and did town halls. Yeah. Get in front of the people. If you believe in what you're saying and doing, don't be shy. It's easy for me to say it, they can be raucous. So print media, film media, radio, social media. And if you can get out in front of the people, do those town halls. Yeah. Well, I think what you're talking about, and I'm not sure you probably do. I, sorry, I can't remember, but read use the word in the book. But I mean, really, it's about that authenticity, right? And letting people see you for who you really are. I mean, we're seeing that with, right, with, the, you know, DeSantis is getting killed right now because he was not allowing reporters to ask him questions. He's trying to fix that, whatever it is. And, you know, and obviously, I mean, say what you want about Trump, the most dangerous man in America. But I think that people would say that, you know, he's very authentic, right? He's himself. He's, and somehow, you know, and that's resonating with some percentage of the, of the population. So to me, I, I think that that sounds right. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Jeff Jackson's, Congressman Jeff Jackson from North Carolina's Twitter account. I'm sure most people are watching it where he just comes direct to camera and just is himself and talks about what's happening in Washington. Let me explain it. Let me tell you why. He's on TikTok too, right? He's on TikTok too. Are those the types of, of examples that you're talking about in terms of talking to getting in front of people or are there others? Yeah. Yeah. All that. Yeah. It's all that. It, it's, we talk about the ABCs. I think you had David Pepper on, right? Yep. David, good friend. Yep. He's, he's a great guy. His book is great. Saving Democracy. I forget the name of his book. Saving Democracy, a user's manual for every American. Right. I think his book and Branding Democrats go hand in hand. I think the two books together are the blueprint for what Democrats should be doing. So he talks about, he has a phrase, which I heard on your podcast with him, that is actually in the book. I'm sure he didn't read my book, but ABC, always be campaigning. So campaigning is not just for the five weeks prior to the election day. It's just not. It's 365 days a year and it's everywhere. So you don't stop. You campaign today, you campaign tomorrow, you campaign in the morning, you campaign in the nighttime. Campaign is now and forever. ABC, always be campaigning, not in an inauthentic, annoying way, but understand that branding takes repetition. We talk in the book about, I don't know, eight or 10 or 12, I forget the number we use, touches. It takes eight or 10 or 12 touches in marketing to make a sale. Well, it's 20 or 30 or 50 for, for political thoughts to permeate a brain. And by the way, something I just want to quickly talk about, Daryl and I say, we're really after, we're never going to change the MAGA crowd. They're a lost cause. Yeah, they are deplorable. I mean, we can agree on that. They have crazy pedophile ideas and all that. We're after like three or four percent, the middle three or four percent, because that's all you need to shift everything. Three or four percent. And we think using what David Pepper says, what, what Ken Weber and Daryl Weber say in Branding Democrats, if you use those techniques, yes, 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 we can shift two or three or four percent from either don't vote or from the red column to the blue column. And that's enough to save America. Yeah, yeah. The ABC is is the marketing equivalent is right. Always be closing. Is that what it is? Right. 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 It's from the sales world. Yeah. Always be campaigning. But I, and what you mean by that, I think, just to reiterate and to highlight, is to always be understanding that everything you're doing is creating your brand. Right. Everything that you're talking about is creating your brand. Which right. And that's where Republicans are so good. They say the same phrases over and over. Whatever it seems like, there's some central Frank Luntz or whoever. A group of people or one person sends out a memo leading from behind or whatever it is for, for the month. Everybody says that. They are much better at it than we are. Why do you think that is out of curiosity? Why do Democrats not do that in your estimation? Well, why do I think that they do it? I don't want to be insulting to my Republican friends, but they seem to be willing to be go in lockstep to whatever they're told. 
let me give you an example that just is fresh on my mind. A simple thing like conspiracy theories. This is not in the book. This is a recent one. Now, conspiracy theory, candidate is on MSNBC or CNN, whatever it might be, conspiracy theory. And certain people believe in conspiracy theories. We should stand up. Conspiracy theories by itself, that phrase is neutral. It's a theory. Could be right, could be wrong. We should change it to absurd claims or wacky conspiracy theories. No Democrat should ever say pro-life and pro-choice. No, they're anti-choice. Never, ever use the word pro-life. Never. If a reporter says, well, what about these conspiracy theories? You mean these absurd claims, these fiction, these malevolent claims that, that are made out there? Don't let them get away with that neutral sounding conspiracy theories. First of all, anti-vaxxers, there's no conspiracy. Pedophiles, there's no conspiracy. So that's a phrase that we've allowed us to be sucked into. No, these are crazy ideas, wacky conspiracy theories. Always be on the offense. Yeah. Well, I think that, and that goes back to something we were talking earlier about this, not playing on their playing field. We were talking about the specific words, but I think a big theme in your book is to not let them control the narrative, not let them control the playing field that we're playing on. We get, we do get sucked into these kind of crazy conversations. I mean, that's kind of the, seems to be the strategy and a lot of the cultural issues in particular, right? Where we're having to defend. We allow ourselves to be on the defense. One thing they are good at, it's the whack mole we say something, well, what about Joe Biden? And they throw out something we never heard of. And so we have to, well, but Joe Biden allocated 78,000 troops. What? What do you, you know, we don't know. Stick with the big issues. Be on offense, our offense. Don't let them set the narrative. Yeah. I want, as we start to wrap up here, I wanted to maybe ask a slightly different question, which was, you've mentioned it a couple of times, but you got to write this book with your son. What was that process like? What an amazing experience that must've been. Oh, there was knockdown drag out fights. It was actually absolutely beautiful. I did most of the writing actually, but everything was filtered through him. I mean, he, he is a true branding expert, high level for big, as I say, big international firms. I was honestly, between us again, I was amazed how little friction there was. And anytime he made a substantial ch or substantive change, I said, oh, my God, that's that's fantastic. So I couldn't be happier with, with the way it worked. And yeah, so his his new firm asked him to not be in a public facing podcast like this. But yeah, he's behind the scenes with me, helping every step of the way. Great. And as we head into 2024 right now and to the next election, but beyond reading your book, which, of course, is the of course, you will want people to do. Any other advice you want to leave people with heading into 2024 as we think about the campaign opportunities that Democrats have? Yeah, well, anybody listening, and David Pepper talks about it. Listen, the future of America is at stake. We've heard that, but it really is now more than ever. I mean, these magonauts are crazy. They just are crazy. They will tear down democracy. You and I could speak for an hour just on that topic. So if you're listening to this, or watching it, do what you can. It's not enough to just give money. I mean, I wrote a whole book. I'm doing these podcasts. I'm not making any money out of this. I just want to help America. And so we ask everybody to work for the small organizations, work for a candidate. There's so many ways that David Pepper does a great job of telling people all the organizations they can either volunteer time to or give money to, but just don't sit back. This is your country. Patriotism is ours, and we need to be true American patriots and do what we can to save America. That is not hyperbole. We need to do it, and we need to do it today. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, this is an all-hands-on-deck situation if I've ever seen one. So, well, thank you so much, Ken, for being with us. Thank you to Daryl as well for the book. Again, it's Branding Democrats, and I hope that everyone will pick up a copy and really appreciate you coming on the on the show today. Yeah, hey, I really enjoyed it, Debbie. Thank you so much. Thank you. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. Thanks to the team at New Deal for producing this episode. We encourage you to bring honor to public service, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars are used in the making of this podcast.